Hi there, everyone. My name is Prerak Jithani. I'm actually an internal medicine resident at Stanford, and today I'm going to go over how to manage electrolyte arrangements in patients. This is obviously not medical advice. This is for anyone who's learning to take care of patients, and it's part of my Intern Essential series. So it's all about how to be an intern, which is your first year of residency, and also can be very helpful, even if you're a medical student in medical school, how to manage these big things. The Credit for today's talk goes to one of my colleagues, Michael Clark. He's also a resident of mine. He taught me some of the basics of this, and he actually gave me a big note that I use to this day when I'm repleting electrolytes. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because I'm showing you that I learned this from someone, and now I'm hoping that I'll teach you, and you all kind of go ahead and disseminate this information as well. We'll be going over like five-ish electrolytes today. Specifically, we'll be going over sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and calcium. And today we will be talking about how to manage um, those electrolytes when they're low. Okay, so we're going to be talking about hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. And the reason we're going to be doing all of these things is because electrolytes, when they're low, can cause drastic changes in your body, and you often want to find out the way to correct them. Those electrolytes can also be high, and when they're high, we manage them in very different ways. Today, we're only going to be focusing on what to do when they're low, okay? Uh, the other thing I will say is because the changes that happen in your body when these electrolytes are low are so vast, I want you to kind of take this pretty seriously because believe it or not, like even when someone has like, for example, an arrhythmia or their telly is showing that they're in an odd rhythm, one of the first things we do is check a magnesium and a potassium because when those electrolytes are not adequately repleted, you can have broad effects including your heart. So with that being said, let's start with sodium. When your sodium is low, you're called hyponatremic. Uh, and when that actually happens, that, I, that is a sign that your total fluid balance is usually high or low. And the reason why we can't just replete sodium in the same way we replete potassium, usually when we replete potassium, we just give people potassium. You can't just give someone sodium because someone can have low sodium for a lot of reasons. Someone might have low sodium because their total body fluid is down. Someone may have low sodium because their total body fluid is up, as in states of cirrhosis, heart failure, and even um, chronic kidney disease, right? So you often have to figure out the cause of someone's low sodium before you replete it. And the way you replete it is if you figure out that someone is just really, really dehydrated, that often is why their sodium might be low. So you often give them fluid back. If you think that someone just has really bad heart failure, you might actually want to diurese them to get their sodium to be back to normal. Sometimes people have SI88, symptom of inappropriate 88 secretion, that, that is usually actually managed with fluid restriction, right? So each of these things is a reason why sodium can be low, and you manage them all very differently. And so I'm not going to get too much into the nuances. I'll make a separate video about hyponatremia later. And this is often why all the internal medicine residents love hyponatremia, because you often have to fix it. But I will say the biggest thing that you should take away uh, from a 24,000-foot standpoint is that you want to know if someone is low sodium, you want to know if that low sodium developed within 48 hours, or if you think that low sodium has been there for more than 48 hours. If it developed within 48 hours, you can usually correct that within a, like a shorter time period. But if it developed over a longer period, like a longer than 48 hour period, you often have to correct it a little bit more slowly in whatever means that is, because you'd be worried about osmotic demyelination syndrome. Now let's talk about potassium. This one is a little bit more straightforward, but potassium is a very important ion in your body. It's actually primarily an intracellular ion, which means that when cells lyse, your potassium can go up really fast and really high. Uh, the reason why it's intracellular is because of the sodium potassium ATPase, and so most of the potassium is inside of your body. Uh, symptoms of low potassium can include weakness, flaccid paralysis, muscle cramps, hyporeflexia, tetany, and rhabdomyolysis. The way we correct low potassium is we give people potassium back, okay? There's a lot of ways of doing this, but oftentimes we do it orally where you can give people physical potassium pills, but you can also give people potassium through the IV, okay? And the reason why hypokalemia can often lead to hyporeflexia is because you then end up having low potassium on the outside of your cells. And when you have a low potassium on the outside of your cell, your resting membrane potential is further from the threshold, and that can often make it harder to fire an action potential. And action potentials, as you know, are very responsible for some of the muscle contraction that you have. Um, when someone is hypokalemic, you, you always want to think about why. It's very easy to replace the potassium so you can solve the problem and you can temporize your patient. 
But think about why someone is hypokalemic. Are they being diuresed? Are they on um, something that can cause low potassium levels? Is their spironolactone being held? Are they getting excess insulin somehow? Do you think they have a VIPoma? Are they on beta agonists? All of those things can cause low potassium levels, so always be thinking about what's causing it. Um, when potassium is low, as I said, we usually just replete it. And the way I replete it is I give people 10 milli equivalents uh, of potassium for every point that they're below uh, 4. And so, for example, if they're at 3.5, I will give them 50 milli equivalents of potassium to get them up to 4. Every 10 milli equivalents of potassium will usually increase your potassium by 0.1. Um, for every uh, point that someone is below three, I usually give them 20 milli equivalents. So let's say someone has a potassium of 2.9. I usually give them 20 milli equivalents to get them from 2.9 to three. And then I give them another 100, uh, another 100 milli equivalents, both orally and IV. You can break it up half and half, 50 and 50, uh, just to get them to up to four. You want to do this slowly. You don't want to oh, obviously overcorrect too quickly. And you don't want to give people a ton of IV potassium. Usually you want to give IV potassium uh, about 10 milli equivalents every hour. Uh, and you do not want to give potassium any faster than that. First of all, it burns. And usually it can be life-threatening if you get potassium too quickly. So give it very slowly. And obviously don't over-replete too quickly. I try to give 40 to 60 milli equivalents in one dose usually over the appropriate time frame. If someone has low potassium, also check their magnesium. And the reason for this is one of the biggest causes of hypokalemia is hypomagnesemia. And the reason for this is, uh, is magnesium actually, as you can see, inhibits potassium secretion through the ROMK channels in the kidney. So when you have low magnesium, your potassium secretion is being inhibited. The inhibition of your potassium secretion is decreased, and that causes low, increased potassium secretion. Um, next up for magnesium... This is a pretty simple one. I usually, from hypomagnesemia, I check their magnesium level. If it's below 1.5, if it's below 2, that means they obviously have low magnesium. If it's, believe, well, it's, if it's between 1.5 and 2, I give 2 grams of IV magnesium. Between 1 and 1.5, I would give 4 grams. And between 0.5 and 1, I give 6 grams of IV, potass, uh, IV magnesium. <laughs> All right. Um, now let's talk a bit about hypocalcemia. So hypocalcemia is interesting because your calcium levels majority of the calcium in your body is bound to albumin. There's only a handful of, uh, of calcium that is freely floating, and that is usually known as the ionized calcium. So the first thing I checked when someone is low on their calcium, it usually is a sign that they're just low on their albumin because most of the calcium is bound to the albumin. So if your albumin is low, your calcium is going to be low. Um, and so because of that, the way you can really check if someone is truly hypocalcemic is by checking an ionized calcium. Because someone can have low calcium, but the total amount of ionized calcium that's in the blood might actually be normal. So with that being said, you want to go ahead and check ionized calcium. And if it's truly low, then you can go ahead and um, replete the calcium. Another quick way to do this is you can also correct for albumin, and there's an MD calc calculator that allows you to calculate your uh, true free calcium by checking your albumin, and you can do that manually. But just know that for every one point your albumin is below normal, you often need to increase your calcium by about 0.8. So you can see that um, you know for every one unit loss of albumin, you often need to add 0.8 to the calcium to account for the fact that one of the reasons your calcium is going to be low is because of the low albumin. All right. Um, Obviously, there's always fun signs that you can look for to see if someone is truly hypocalcemic. If they have Trousseau sign, which is like filling of the blood pressure cuff induces a muscle spasm in your arm, or they can have Chevex sign where you can tap and you can actually get a facial muscle spasm. Um, acidosis can often lead to an increase in ionized calcium, and alkalosis can lead to a decrease in ionized calcium. And again, this is because majority of calcium is positively charged, and it binds to negatively charged albumin. If you're in an acidotic environment, acidotic is means H+, plus, that H+, plus will displace the calcium on the albumin and you'll have increase in ionized calcium because the calcium will come off of the uh, albumin and vice versa will happen in alkalosis. Um, and then the way I usually replete calcium is right here. You can follow this formula if you want. Uh, usually I check to make sure that they truly have low calcium. Once I know that they have low calcium, you can actually give them calcium gluconate usually, okay? One or two grams based on the levels. Um, lastly, let's end with phosphorus. 
Phosphorus is again very important. Majority of your phosphorus is inside of your cells, and why is that? Because most of the ATP is inside of your cells, and most of the ATP is phosphate. But regardless, oftentimes when someone has low phosphorus, I get worried because um, that can cause a lot of um, arrhythmias, right? And so the way I give phosphorus is usually right here. I can tell you how I give it. It's usually all IV, usually through potassium phosphate or sodium phosphate. The cool part is if someone has low phosphorus and low potassium, I try to give them potassium phosphate because that will hit the potassium and the phosphate. Um, whenever something is low, I don't want you to always just accept it. I want you to think about why that's the case. And in this case, sometimes I think about refeeding syndrome, right? Like sometimes when people eat after a long time, that causes a surge in their insulin, which actually then shifts a lot of phosphate inside the cell. So always think about why someone is low. You can always replete here. There's milk alkali syndrome. There's hungry bone syndrome. Usually hungry bone happens after parathyroidectomy because now you don't have parathyroid hormone. And when you don't have parathyroid hormone, um, Parathyroid hormone is always responsible for helping you break down a bit of your bone and get phosphate out into the blood. And so if that doesn't help, if that's not there, then your bones are hungry and they kind of pick up all the phosphate. So hopefully this is helpful for you. If it was, please drop a like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I really appreciate it. And I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.